beautiful. Good morning, Grace. So, uh, you know, it's kind of fun having a little two-year-old on stage this morning simply because I'm thinking about two-year-olds this morning just because of, you know, just thinking about some of the things that they watch on TV and in movies and that kind of stuff because, you know, Sean, because he's my son, he's into anything with an engine. And so he likes cars and, and we've seen cars one, two, and three no idea how many times. But, but there's also basically Cars in the Sky, which is Planes, the movie Planes. It was a Disney movie. And I don't know as much about Planes, but I know enough to know that it's ridiculous. Uh, I, I did read an article that said there are some things about the aeronautics that happened that Disney actually got right. But, but the whole premise of this thing is that there's this crop dusting plane, and his name is Dusty, because Disney's really creative like that. And so he decides, though, even though he's a crop dusting plane, that he, just in his heart, he knows he's a racing plane, and he can do it. Like, he can go out there with, I don't remember enough about the movie to know, because it's not like on Sean's top list, right? So I don't remember enough to know if he's racing against propeller planes or jet planes. Is Mike McDonald here today? Just making sure I'm not going to make him cringe. I don't see him around, right? Uh, but he's a pilot for all those who don't know. I know I have some other planes people out here. But, uh, but anyway, you kind of look at the things he wanted to do. He wanted to be a racing plane, and so he decided, by golly, I can do it. And he's going to go and live his dreams, which is a great premise, right? We want to encourage kids to, to not give up, to work hard for their dreams. And he did. Dusty worked hard, and he went out and he got into a race, and he was able to win. That's, that's where it gets ridiculous, right? It's a crop dusting plane. And so I don't, again, I don't know much about planes. I just know that, that for, for Dusty, being a crop dusting plane, if he were to go the speeds, if somehow his little crop dusting engine could carry him at the speeds of racing planes, I'm pretty sure the fuselage falls apart. I just think that's how it goes, right? Like the only way that Dusty is going to win a race in one piece is if all of the other planes are disqualified or crash for some reason. That's, that's just the only way it works. Well, there's actually a sequel to the movie too. And so Dusty goes, and I haven't seen the movie, the actual sequel to that movie. I've only read the book. Seriously, I've read the book, like lots of nights. Uh, but it's where Dusty, they, they find out they need another uh, firefighting plane at the airport. And so Dusty goes to firefighting school. So he's a crop duster, a racer, and now he's going to be a firefighter. And so he goes and they, they put some, uh, the water pontoon so he can land in the water and he can scoop up some water. To me, this is more plausible, just a little bit, because he picks up whatever you crop dust with. So maybe he could pick up water, but I'm pretty sure that if he picked up that much water to be able to do any damage to a fire in a forest that he wouldn't be able to take off again. Just, just guessing, right? So there's just, he just, it doesn't make any sense. You know, it's a great encouraging premise to live your dreams, but, but there are some things that just go against the laws of physics and nature, right? Like we know this, we can suspend it for cartoons. I grew up watching the Dukes of Hazard, and, and we pretended, we suspended the idea that, that the General Lee was just one car that didn't get destroyed every time it jumped, which is why those things are so expensive now, right? So I know for myself, just based on nature, based on the laws of physics, I am not going to be an NFL quarterback, ever, right? Can you imagine what would happen if I tried? For one, I'd be laughed at. But let's just say that there was some kind of contest out there, and I won this contest, which would be a dumb one to get into anyway, and I was able to go out and, and be a starting quarterback for any NFL team. What would happen? I would be seriously injured. I might die. It, it's, it's possible either way, right? And, and like, even if I had this incredible line that were to block for me, it's guaranteed that I would mess up and the fans would boo me out of there. Like, it just isn't going to happen no matter how long or how hard I work at it. It's just not who I am, and I'm already 38 years old, right? So this is not in my future. Does that make me less important than an NFL quarterback? I mean, outside of the football field, obviously I'm worthless on a football field. D does it make me less useful than an NFL quarterback in, in the world in general? What if, what if I just feel like, I just know in my heart, I've got to be an NFL quarterback. That is what the Lord desired for me. That's what I'm made for. I just feel it. So I'm going to go do it. Does that mean any more that I can actually go and do it? No, I live in reality, or try to most of the time, right? And the reality is that, that God created with, with all kinds of wonderful diversity, and I'm not just talking about people, all that too, but like all of creation. And that's one of the things I love about living in Chattanooga. We went up to Pigeon Forge for our staff retreat this past week as well, and you just see so many cool things, all these, these creatures around you realize that a lady in our church a couple of months ago was stalled on her way here because a bear ran into her car. How many of you have hit a deer before? 
Anyone here hit a bear? Right? Not a whole lot. That hand went up really lowly. Right? But, but the bear actually hit her. Like, that's just the kind of creation diversity that we've got and all the foliage and just the beauty that God has designed, all this diversity that, that's been there since the beginning. And we see it even within species. You look around this room, there's a lot of things about us that are homogenous, but there are a lot of things about all of us that are very different. There's not a lot of you that I look out here and I think, I, I've got the wrong person here, right? I don't confuse you. We can put people next to each other and, and I know which one's which. Judith's older brothers, they are twins. I know which one is which. You, you know these things, right? Her older brother is not her brother is not her twin, right? That I can, I can tell the difference. But I know which of them is which. I can tell these things. And so the, within creation, God even he set up the, the order of kinds of creation too, that there's kind of this hierarchy within there. And, and there's order even inside of the levels. And what we see is that, that God, back in Genesis, he put mankind over all of creation. He says, fill the earth, subdue it, and multiply the angels, we're going to look at this a little bit later, but angels are, are part of creation. And, and right now, Hebrews says they're a little higher than man, but eventually we're going to judge the angels. And God, he's over all of it. In order, though, the order of things in the world, the order of how we're supposed to do things, in order in worship in particular, that was just one of the problems that the people in the Corinthian church were facing that Paul dealt with. And each of the main issues that he's dealing with, they, they've had this kind of corresponding issue today. So that the Corinthian letter continues to be this very applicable thing. We want to put the chart up here and just look at some of the things that we've talked about and, and how those things compare today. One of the first things that we talked about, which is really kind of the overarching issue in Corinth, was an issue of division within the church. That they were divided on all kinds of things. And so that was the first thing that Paul talked about to set up everything else going forward. Because all of these other issues that we're talking about is things that one group believes this and one group believes this and they can't come together on it. They're arguing about these things. We look around today and, and we do, we still see division in churches over different things. But look at our political landscape. That, that our, we have these identity politics that we, our, our culture wants to divide people into group after group after group based on all kinds of different things and then pit those against each other. You find people that we have kind of this, this idea of celebrity pastors. John Chris has a, a funny video out there where there's like this fantasy pastor draft and then people start kind of picking their favorite pastors for the year and uh, for their competitions. But, but we kind of align with these guys. We'll fight over that stuff. Like I, I follow this guy and I follow this guy just like they did back then. We've got these issues that we dealt with after that of, of sexual immorality. And, and we see that rampant today in, in, in so many different ways that it's, and there, that's on the slide there too, it should be. But, but there's, it's just rampant in all of our culture, this immorality. And then, and then we started seeing that there were interchurch lawsuits, that people, Christians were suing Christians within the church over you know, property or, or various things, just trying to get what they thought they deserved or what they wanted. And, and today, we still, we see lawsuits that Christians are bringing against their churches, that churches are suing churches. I heard about one of those uh, just a few weeks ago, that church, a church, one church suing another and, and being in battle in court for a couple of years. We see churches going through these kinds of things and Christians going through these kinds of things. And then we dealt with marriage and divorce, which is still a common thing to deal with today and, and learn too that, that we've got to find some good ways to care for people going through those kinds of things. We were talking in just the past few weeks, there was this issue that came up in the Corinthian church of, of meat sacrificed to idols. Is that okay? Can you eat that kind of meat? And today we see similar kinds of issues, even though we're not talking about meat sacrificed to idols, there were several different various ways that, that we talked about that deal with the sacred versus the secular. What is okay? When, is, when are you crossing a line there? And it all came down, a lot of it, to the use of freedom and kind of the use of our rights. And what we see today is the same thing that we saw in Corinth is this entitlement mindset of my way, my rights, my freedoms, I deserve, do my thing. And it's all about those kinds of things. It's all about me. And that brings us to what we're dealing with today in this letter to the first Corinthian, to the Corinthian church, first letter to their church. We're beginning the section today that is dealing with order in worship. What are you supposed to do? Like in this setting, what are things supposed to be like? Because a lot of them disagreed on it. A lot of them were even doing sinful things as we're going to see. It includes even spiritual gifts. What are the purposes and the ways to use spiritual gifts within a congregation, within a worship setting? And this is going to be in chapters 11 through 14 that we see these things over the next several weeks. 
there's not really a point in this letter to Corinth where we kind of get in there and we, we say the subject, oh, this is an easy one to deal with. It's not a big issue, right? It's just there are so many things that are difficult and, and a lot of controversies in there that we still struggle today to figure out exactly what things meant or, or how they apply or it's just something that, man, it's still difficult today. The Corinthian church, and one of the overarching things is that they were using their freedom or what they perceived as their rights and their knowledge in order to rebel. To rebel not necessarily just against the Lord, although that's ultimately where it goes, but to turn over everything from society and say, we're going to do things our way. Because I have freedom in Christ, I can do whatever I want. Paul addresses that to the Romans as well. It was kind of a common thing. When you, when you hear the real gospel, that's a risk that people bring in there because there is this incredible freedom. But they were using it to rebel. We're looking at another way that some of the people in that church twisted the gospel for the purpose of self-indulgence. I know, it's hard to imagine, right? We've been seeing this in Corinth the whole time. We see it today. The people take the gospel and they, and they use it for selfish purposes instead of what it was really intended for. The main example that Paul uses here in, in this passage we're looking at is, is one of the more controversial in the Bible. Controversial not so much in that people necessarily disagree and fight over it all the time, but it's one of those things that a lot of folks don't understand, and there are some, some heated opinions on it. And so it's, it's this thing he's talking about in this passage about male and female head coverings and, and even hair. And I realize for some of you men, you have no choice. Like, you're going to obey this no problem whatsoever, right? It's just, that's easy. I heard some groaning in that as well. Well, there's the laughing. That's kind of fun, right? But, but that's kind of the thing he's dealing with. And so we want to look and just see the principle behind those things. And this is, this is an area where I think a lot of us miss the point because it's easy to get swayed too far one way or the other when we're trying to deal with this passage. And when we do that, we tend to end up kind of losing the forest for the trees, that we focus so much on the details that we miss out on the principle. We miss the, the very valuably applicable principles for all of us in trying to figure out the details. And so let's commit ourselves, even as we look at the details today, let's commit ourselves to be open to the Holy Spirit's leading. And, and honestly, there are going to be a couple of points in here where some God-fearing, Holy Spirit-driven people in this room, we may disagree on how to apply some of these things. Even if we all agree that God's word is truth and it must be followed, the way that that is supposed to happen, some of us might disagree. And that's okay, right? We, we can live with these kinds of things, but we want to be committed to following what the Holy Spirit tells us. Let's commit ourselves to learning and applying what God has to tell all of us more generally as well. So let's pray as we dig into God's word. God, I do thank you for your word, for your truth, for the direction that we see to churches thousands of years ago that applies to us today. Even when sometimes it's, it's difficult for us to figure out necessarily how to use these things today. So God, help us to understand what you were saying then, how it applies now, and, and to see some real life transformation in ourselves. Today in particular, just looking at this desire, continued desire for other-centered freedom in Christ, but really today to think about submission Submission to your will, to your authority, to your design. And God, that we will be okay with that, that we won't abuse it, but that we will thrive in it. And so drive us toward that in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so why are we talking about order? Well, it's because God created order. And so we want, we want to understand it. And it's order in worship, but it's order in the world as well. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting out in verses 1 through 3, if you want to turn there with me. Paul starts out here, it's this very, I think, famous verse. We, we hear this verse quite often. It's a powerful one. I love it. And Paul says, be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. He goes on, now I praise you, the Corinthian church, because you remember me in everything and hold, fir hold firmly to the traditions, meaning the, 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 basically he's talking in a lot of ways about the New Testament traditions, those things passed on to all the churches. He says, just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of every woman, as the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. Okay. So, so in each issue that Paul addressed in this letter, what, what we're seeing, I hope we're catching the theme in here of what Paul does. He, he's taking an issue that, that was happening, kind of the base core issue or, or the, the, the symptom, if you will, of what was going on, what was dividing the, this group of people. 
And he takes that and he says, okay, I'm going to address that particular thing, but I'm going to teach you the, the principle behind it so that you know how it goes with everything else, so that it's not just this one thing we're dealing with. And in every one of those things, it's not just, hey, here's a principle, but he's going to take that back and I want to show you this principle by showing you to Christ. That it's all based on who Christ is and, and what he has done. And, and, and it's just taking everything and saying, focus on Christ the whole time. Derek Prime writes in opening up 1 Corinthians that the thing for which to watch is the way in which Paul consistently relates every subject and problem to the centrality of the person and work of our Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Most of the problems and difficulties of the Corinthian church arose from their losing sight of him and his headship. The enemy of our souls encourages that same peril today. What is that phrase? There's this phrase, I say it constantly in here, that I want us to go, go to every time that, we, that we're struggling with sin or something emotional or whatever it might be. What is that phrase? Focus on Christ. That we look to Jesus. What is Paul saying here? What is he saying in his word? He's saying, focus on Jesus. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. Christ is the ultimate one. He's the one to look for. Just follow Christ Watch some things start working out. Not saying watch things work out in the, necessarily in the way that you want to, but just watch how he transforms you. You know what's helped me the most in my more stressful times in ministry through the years? It's just focusing on Christ instead of myself or a situation or, or people or anything like that. And in that famous little statement, follow me as I follow Christ, Paul is setting up God's order which goes throughout this whole passage. And it is absolutely Christ-centered. Paul's life is only worth following to the extent that he is following Christ. He's not saying, hey, I'm perfect, so do everything that I do. But he says, follow me as I follow Christ. And he's able to say that because he is wholeheartedly wanting to follow the Lord. I read a story in uh, preparing for a sermon a couple months ago. I can't remember if I shared it in here or not. But it was this little boy that kind of went to his grandfather when he was very young. I think he had, he had just become a Christian. And, and he goes to him and, and he sees these wonderful things in his grandfather. He says, Granddad, tell me how to be a Christian. He says, okay, I will. Decades later, the, the grandfather is on his deathbed. He's in the hospital. The son, or the grandson now all grown up, he, he's going to visit his grandfather. And he's saying, hey, you know, you told me you were going to tell me about how to live as a Christian. And, and his grandfather simply says, did you watch me? Did you see me? Did you follow well, how I was following Christ? That's what Paul is saying. Think about what that little statement from Paul was saying to the Corinthian church. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. So many people in the Corinthian church were, they were all about my ways, my rights, my freedoms, what I deserve, what I want, and my knowledge that tells me I can have all of these things. Paul says, well, I'm all about Jesus' way. That, that, and it's not just that he's saying it, that's really, that's how he lived. He's like, I don't care about all of that. But me aside, I, I, just, I just want to follow the Lord. We need people like Paul in our lives. I hope you've got that. People that you can go to and say, I, I know that this person is following the Lord. You can go and ask them questions. You can watch the ways that they live their life and it, and it will inform how you live yours. And whether we like it or not, People are watching your life as well. You understand that even if it's not something you want or you're asking for, when people know that you're a Christian, be it your children, others in your family, people around this church, if you're in here now, people see you, people that you work with, people in your neighborhood, if they know that you're a believer, you're the example they have. And that's, that's a big deal. People are looking at us. How do we do that well? How do we honor Christ well when people are watching our lives? The same thing that Paul says. Follow me as I follow Christ. Look to Jesus. So we've got the, the, the Jesus first order. I think we see that here. That's, that's the crux of all of it. That's, that's the only way. That's the foundation. It's the only way that we get the rest of it. I think we're good with that, at least in theory. Not that we, that we practice it perfectly all the time. But I think we're good with that in theory as Christians. But, but Paul moves on. And then we've got this first controversial term, which is headship. Oh, and man, do we mess that one up on both ends. We take it too extreme or we don't take it far enough. What helps is, is when we keep the Bible in context. 
And we have got to do that. We've got to keep the Bible in context, especially the immediate context, to be able to look at why Paul was writing, why any of this was written, and who he's writing to, and in what circumstances, and what means what. Paul is writing to the people in in Corinth about their rebellion, about self-indulgence, and then writing about it in multiple different ways. He's writing about the misuse of Christian liberty, that they knew that they had freedom in Christ. They know that in Christ they are loved and accepted, lovable and acceptable. They knew these things, but they were using that the wrong way. They were using it for indulgence, for self-indulgence. Here, this this particular passage in 1 Corinthians 11, 11, they were ignoring the accepted customs of the general society and church. They said, because I have Christ and I have this freedom, I can go out and do all kinds of goofy stuff. It doesn't matter what it may say to the people around. I'm throwing off everything and just doing whatever I want. We're going to get to the more controversial or confusing part about head coverings uh, pretty soon here. But Paul starts really at this point of subordination as, as kind of a main point that gets to the rest of it. And so let's figure out this head thing, this headship thing. What does it mean to be, to be the head of something? Are we talking about superior and inferior? Because it does say, if we back up to what, what we see in the passage there, right? Man is the head of a woman. That's the one that, that we, I think, see a lot of abuse toward at different times. Does that mean then that women are inferior to men? <laughs> I like that I have the shout out over there. That's good. If it does then Jesus is inferior to the Father. That's in that passage too. See, God is the divine fountainhead from which all things flow. And it happens by Christ. There are roles for each of the persons of the Godhead in the Trinity. And so in the same way, the woman is not inferior to the man. Both of us, we we have roles to fill. Both of those roles, they are necessary. They are important. One major error of thought today, not just in the church, but just in general in our culture, is this idea that things that are different can't be equal. That's just not true. Our triune God shows us that is false. I love how Claire Smith describes that in the the Gospel Gospel Coalition website. She says, for God to be Christ's head doesn't mean that Jesus is any less God. It doesn't mean inferior status. It simply means that in his love for us and in his love and obedience to the Father, Jesus submits himself to the headship of the Father and seeks to bring him glory in all he does. By the way, Christ is glorified as well. And it also means that whatever God's word has to say to us here about authority and order in relationships originates in the life of God. This is where we can learn some things. But we've got to be careful not to take it too far. And quite honestly, I think that the church, I'm not specifically speaking of our church, but kind of the universal church, we've been guilty of that pretty often, of taking this too far. With this and with some similar passages, you look in 1 Timothy where women are talked about as well, we, we, I think we, we can really say, and looking back at Ephesians as well, that the husband is the head of the family, as Christ is the head of the church, and you even see here God is the head of Christ. But it's harder to say, even though sometimes we try to do it, it's harder to say that that means that all men are the head of all women, that men are kind of dominant. Specifically, what we're looking at in the context of who Paul is writing to and when, remember, he is writing to a church worship context. He's not writing about the whole world all the time in every situation. It's not about government. It's not about the workplace. It's not about school. It's not about those kinds of things, saying that this is how everything operates everywhere all times. And so you're kind of hard-pressed to start applying this too broadly. We want to tread very lightly in those kinds of things. There are biblical roles of men and women. That's what this is about here, the biblical roles of men and women. And it's more about what happens in the church, submission to elders, submission you know, to the head of a family, to husbands, those kinds of things. And even then, it's not talking about inequality. And so as we, as we walk in our roles, because God has given us roles as, as who we are as people, God has given us roles, and as we walk in those and we do what God has designed, what Jesus has commanded, people will learn from our example of submission, whether it's positive or negative. If I say, God, I see what you say in your word about what my role is as a person, and I don't want to do it, others see that. Others see that, and it says, okay, then the scripture is not really worth paying attention to. Why do you even believe this stuff? Or, or maybe I just don't have to follow it either. 
But if, if we go around and we say, okay, you know what? This is what God's word says. I'm going to live this way because I believe it, and I believe that's actually best for me even. The people around us are going to see that. They'll see that submission, and that matters. So I want you to think about who is imitating your walk with Christ, your walk with Jesus. Who is around you that sees that on a day-to-day basis? Is that a good thing? Are you intentionally inviting people to do that, to be able to say, I want you to follow me as I follow Christ. Let me invest in your life. It's one of the things we're meant to do. See, people need to learn from our lives that God created order that should be accepted. Let's move on to verses 4 through 10. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head, for she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to have his head covered, since he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of man. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Okay, the culture around us loves to pull this one out, right? Pull this one and say, oh, Paul hates women, right? Totally missing the point of what we're getting to here, right? Remember to look at the culture and where we're, where we're studying, Now, look around the room a little bit. Go ahead and look at each other, okay? I think what we're going to notice here, I think it's kind of obvious how we think this passage is actually applied. You know, I I don't see a lot of the women in here who are putting on a shawl or a head covering of any kind or putting your hands over your on your head when you pray. You might be. There may be some I just haven't noticed. That's totally fine. I'm not saying that you shouldn't. But I think it shows how we think about this passage if we think about it. But I'm betting that not all of us know why. There's more of just, oh, that's just how we do things or don't do things. And also notice that there are no men in here wearing hats right now. And we may wonder why. Some of you may want to be wearing hats right now, right? Some of you might even be a little bit unsure if you should be wearing a hat or some kind of head covering or not. Some of you might be a little bit uncomfortable with it. But it applies all the same whether you're comfortable with it or not. So I want you to ask yourself this question. If we're saying that, and this is not what I was saying a second ago, but in a different way, that that we are supposed to have the head covering exactly as it says in here, that we should have, you know, women should have their heads covered, men not, and we're going to get into long hair, short hair, those kinds of things. If, If I can clearly demonstrate to you that that is how it's supposed to be today, will you submit? Even though it might look a little different, when we pray here, when I'm wrapping up and I'm praying, well, women, would you put your hands over your head perhaps or, or something else there? Because I'm not saying that's where we're going with this, but I think that gets a little bit at, at kind of the heart issue. Are we willing to submit even if it may go against the culture or what we're used to or what we're comfortable with? Now, for myself, I believe this is more about the meaning of the head covering than the actual item or article of clothing itself. That, that's where I, I come down on this. It's okay if you disagree on that. It's totally fine. If your conscience tells you to cover your head when you pray or prophesy, we'll get to those words too, then do it. What do we see before? I mean, if, you, if the Lord is telling you something, you're convicted in, in a way that doesn't go against God's word, you need to go with that conviction, with that conscience, so that you're not sinning against your conscience. But I want to deal with some of the words in here too. And there's this one prophecy in here. It talks about that, so we want to talk about that first because we're talking about a public worship gathering. And Paul is talking about this public worship gathering. He says, when women are praying or prophesying in the public worship gathering. And yet he wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2 to let the women keep silent in church, as as it's translated in some places. We do have to think about the context of what's being talked about. 1 Timothy 2 is about teaching. It's about authority, submitting to the authority, not so that women are not supposed to teach or have authority over men. It's more of, you know, kind of that elder type position. It's very different than what Paul is talking about here. This is a little more broad. Now, I think we know what prayer is, right? Because we talk about praying and prophesying, those things being okay. I think prophecy here in this, 
This is just what I'm coming to understand, and I could be wrong on this. But I think the way that prophecy is being talked about here is more like sharing a testimony. That It's not like prophecy in the Old Testament where it's you, know, you get up and you share this thing that's about to happen or whatever, and if you get it wrong, then you're supposed to be taken outside of the city gates and slaughtered. Right? That, I don't think that's what we're getting at here. But it's more like sharing that testimony. And so the women could prophesy in church in that time, but they wouldn't then be able to take that elder role of weighing that prophecy or teaching, having authority over the men, the entire church in that way. What we're talking about here, I think, is, is sharing truth publicly to encourage other Christians. It's going to be something that is, that is focused on the gospel, that, that's going to be probably about how God is moving in your life or just in general. It's going to be something, I think, that's inspiring, that, that just practically displays how to live the gospel. It's basically saying, here's how God is working in my life. Here's what I see God doing around me. But it's not something that is replacing the sermon, kind of the main teaching in, in the public worship setting, right? It's not replacing it, but it may enhance it. Now, I'm not firm on that. It could be what it means. But then we have this other word about the head covering. And so we want to figure out what the head covering was. And so there has been some more recent uh, discovery in the historical uh, research setting that, that suggests that this head covering was a cultural sign of marriage in those days. That, that the woman, and only the woman, would wear a head covering to show submission to her husband. And so then Paul is taking this and saying then within the church context, that head covering would be a cultural way of demonstrating that you are submitted to the authority in the church and submitted to the Lord to God and to the elders. And so it is an article of clothing, and it is a very specific article of clothing that is being talked about that has a particular meaning. And yet it's the woman who's supposed to wear it and not the man. Why? Because if the men did in that culture, they would look like women. They would be mistaken for women. Today, it'd be kind of like, you know, if a woman went into the church and as soon as she got there, she's like publicly taking her ring off. The people know she's married and she's pulling that ring off. Or maybe if she's out in the community somewhere and she's like, okay, I'm going out and hanging out with these people, this, that puppy's coming off. It's kind of a scandalous kind of thing. It says that I want nothing to do with that husband. I'm not going to be faithful to him. For men, you know, it's, it's like denying our role as men, which a lot of us do by our actions. Today, I think it'd be kind of like cross-dressing. But I think men wearing hats in church, as we get to that part, I don't think it's necessarily wrong. Like, I think it applies the similar way to, to women and their head coverings, so that it's more about what does it say in the culture. So for our culture, and particularly in our church setting, it, it's a sign of disrespect in a lot of U.S. culture to have your hat on inside of any building sometimes, but anymore, it's more to, you know, formal settings, churches, those kinds of things and then not everywhere you go. So that if someone were to come in and, and have a hat on their head and it's taken as a disrespectful thing that they're saying, I don't care what anyone around me thinks, I don't care what the Lord may say, that it's a disrespectful thing and so better idea to take it off. But if you're in a culture where that doesn't matter, it's not as big of a deal. We, just, we wanna be respectful and show proper authority and respect within the church. Now, why is this important? It's because all of these things, the intent of all of these things, I believe, is to reflect created order. And I want to make thing, one thing really clear that comes up in this passage because it's missed often. Men and women, male and female, you are both created in God's image. Right? Let's make sure we know what this passage does and doesn't say. Paul is only talking about the woman being the glory of a man. When he refers to the man being the image and glory of God, he says both. When he goes to the woman, he's only talking about the glory, not the image. Women, you bear God's image. All right? We want to make sure that's clear. In fact, we don't bear the image very well without women. God said it was not good for a man to be alone. He created it. It's the only thing in creation. He said that's not good. He needs something else, and he created woman. Judith, she makes me look good, Right? I mean, she, very honestly, the search committee will tell you this. If it wasn't for her, I probably wouldn't have been the top choice. You know, she's the reason I'm here, I think. And so in a way, it kind of brings me some glory there, and it, and it goes both ways. And so what Paul's getting at is that women, they are the glory of man by origin and by purpose. They came from man, you know, pulled out the rib, right? And, and f they're for him in the sense that they are, the men are incomplete without you right? Not this servant kind of thing, go do what I tell you, but it's, we're incomplete without the woman. We need them. 
If you think that means that, that men then can dominate women, that women are somehow our play toys or our slaves, then you have totally missed the point of what Paul is getting at here. You've missed the power of what is being said. The woman is the missing piece of being able to carry out the task that God gave us to subdue the earth and rule it and fill it. And it works very much the same in the church. Yes, in the church, I believe there are some differences in our roles, but the church cannot be the church and do what we are intended to do without women. Can you imagine how quickly this church would bomb if there were no women here? If the women just said, I'm not doing anything, right? It just doesn't work. And Paul tells us why this is so important. Submitting to God's designed order shows his authority. And he says, not only do other people see it, but the angels see this. And there are different ways to take this. I want to give you a take on this that I think fits. Eventually, we're going to judge the angels. They are watching us. They are here. They, they see what's going on. And I believe they may need to see us submitting to God's design. That we are submitted to God's authority. And we can, at some point, now we'll be perfected at that point, be able to handle carrying out what he calls us to do even in judging the angels. That they would submit as well. Because while they are a little bit above us now, we are eventually going to judge them. That's God's order. That's the way he designed things. So are you willing to live out God's created order? And are you really willing to do that? Like, in every way. Because you understand that God's created order, the way that, that he sets things up, we're only talking about one part of that right now. See, God created order that should be accepted and not twisted. Let's look at verses 11 and 12. However, in the Lord, neither is woman independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as the woman originates from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman, and all things originate from God. Just in case you didn't think we were going to see the other perspective on some of these things, right? It's not just me that, that sees the tendency that we have as people, even as Christians, to take this passage too far and to put it in places it's not intended to go. Paul addressed it just to be clear. He says, we are equal. So don't miss that, right? We, we're equal, man and woman. He says, so yeah, Eve, Eve came from Adam. We get that. That's where the origins come from. But where has every man come from since then? Woman. Women, you have a better record, okay? We all come from, from the women. We had one that came from the man, right? And so church, I want to say again that we as the big C church, the universal church, we have tended to take this too far. And even been as, as the church in, in a great deal of our existence, rather misogynistic and even oftentimes oppressive of women. Ladies, if you have ever felt second class or lesser or undervalued or, or underappreciated, know that you deserve better than that. That is, that is not what God designed. You are God's wonderful creation in his very own image. And his purposes include you every bit as much as any man or men in general. Men would be completely lost without you. I'm not saying that we have to have wives to be complete. But I'm just saying men in general, we would be completely lost without women. And I'm not just talking about like finding our way on a map because we're still lost and now we, we have phones that help take care of those things, right? His purposes include all of us. And if you've ever felt any different than that here, I really am sorry for that. And we, we don't want to be like that. Man, if, if, you are, if you are dominating your wife, if you're dominating your, your family or women in general, stop it. it it's wrong. And I, and I realize just saying stop it doesn't mean it just happens like that. We want to help you walk through that and, and walk according to the truth because it's not godly. Husbands are called to love their wives sacrificially. I want you all to look around the room again. So no one's looking at me right now, right? Look at each other. Quit looking at me. Some of you still are. There we go. Okay. I still see your eyes looking at me, but you're a security team, so we're good, right? Okay, so look around the room. You see everyone that you see here, everyone here is made in God's image. How would God feel about the way that you treat his image bearer that he designed? Now, that's not meant to be a guilty thing for everyone. That's just meant to be some, some self-reflection there. These people that you see in this room, they are, they are not to be used for your selfish pleasure. They are not your slaves to satisfy you in any way you choose. We, all of us, male and female, we, we are one. And we, we are all gifts from God to each other. Do you view and treat people, not just male and female, but any kind of ways we may have divided people up, do you view and treat people with the respect and the equality that is inherent in them? 
Because God created order that should be accepted, not twisted, just as he instills in us. He wrote this truth on our hearts. Let's look at verses 13 through 16. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself tell you, teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. But if one is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice, nor have the churches of God. And so Paul's got two more points here for men and for women to kind of wrap this section up and then move on to some more things about that order in worship. And the first is that nature itself, the way we are designed, something inherent in us, points to God's created purpose. As with the covering, I don't think this is as much about the length of hair as what the length of hair says in the cultural context and setting. Natural law, that's the, the instinctive sense of right and wrong, has shown throughout history that male and female are different. Men and women are different. I think most of us know that, right? And so we're supposed to act that out. And so then, in those days, a woman who had her head shaved, that was a sign of shame. If she were to shave her head, it would be a shameful thing then. These days, what do you automatically think if you see a woman with a head shaved? She probably has cancer, right? It's not necessarily a shameful thing anymore, or maybe she's supporting somebody who does. That tends to be what we think these days. Men of different cultures and different times, they had different lengths of hair. Solomon, he didn't cut his hair. I mean, eventually it was cut, but that was a big problem, right? Imagine that hair got pretty long, and it was cut and it was gone. The Spartans, if you know anything about the Spartans, they actually had shoulder-length hair was the norm. Nobody considered them effeminate. If they did, nobody was saying it, right? Because those are the Spartans and they're tough dudes. So I think, I believe in this passage and could be wrong in this, but I think that the point is more about accepting and submitting to how God designed you as male and female. And then living within kind of the cultural expressions of that, that, that truly do express those things. That, that there is a difference and that you are submitting to that difference. And this may be the fastest growing fight that we've got from the culture regarding this passage right now. Last week, we, we drove to the staff retreat. With the, we had the guys in one car and the ladies in another. And I said to one of the guys, jokingly, I said, is, is that okay? Can we call each other male and female? Can we do that anymore? Totally joking about that. But that's, I mean, that's really where our culture is, that we can't even talk about those differences. Our culture is trying to say that male and female is what you choose. D d d ridiculous, right? I mean, th there's this movement to let children choose their gender. That goes against God's design. And I realize that the people who are saying these things are probably not Christian people, but it's not just against God's designs. That goes against genetic science. Like these are just proven things that we've known for a while now. It is flat out just rebellion is all it is. So we're gonna do things our way. We're gonna shrug off everything that God has instilled in us that goes against our conscience and our nature. It goes against that inherent intuitive sense of right and wrong. And quite frankly, it's typically a sign of mental illness. Now, we've got a quote we're going to put up here, and you're going to notice a long list. Like more, There's more people listed below this thing than there are words in the actual quote, right? And that's just to show you, these are leading pediatricians, doctors, professionals who have worked on this paper together, and what they've concluded is that conditioning children into believing a lifetime of chemical and surgical impersonation of the opposite sex is normal and healthful, that's child abuse. It's very wrong. Now, there may be some people here who are dealing with those kinds of things. And I'm betting that more and more of us, because of what the culture is saying to us, more and more of us are going to know people who are struggling with these things. And if that is something that you struggle with, don't listen to the world. Listen to the truth from God's word that he's even written on our hearts. God knows best. He designed you. Listen, there are people trained to help you with these things. You know, just because we struggle with sin, we, we all struggle with sin. And sometimes we need some folks to come along and help us move through those kinds of things. We struggle with sickness and we struggle with disease and we need people to help us with those things. And we'd love to get you in contact with some folks who can help you if that's something that you struggle with or if you know somebody who does. Don't be afraid to open up about that. We're not here to judge people over these things. We just want to see people drawn closer to what the Lord has designed and closer to the Lord himself. The Christians in Corinth, they were struggling, some of them, certainly not all, but they were struggling with, with throwing off gender identity for the sake of freedom. It's saying, I've got freedom in Christ, I've got the gospel, now I can go do what I want, I'm going to throw that part off too. But Paul took the time to correct them. 
Now, it may not be, then be as abnormal as you think to struggle with those kinds of things. The issue in, in all of this is, is really just where are we looking for guidance? Where are we looking for truth, for, for how we're going to live? And that leads to Paul's second point in these few verses here. There's not another acceptable way. He says this is, just, this is not just a you kind of thing. This is what the churches do. We all know this. Look at it. You see it in the church. This is how we live. And he's basically saying submit to God's design. Submit to what we are doing. Michael Zwiegel, uh, professor at DTS, I've quoted before because I just love what, uh, a lot of what he has to say. He writes, if conscience submits to reason, it will be rationalized. If conscience submits to emotion, it will be compromised. If conscience submits to society, it will be relativized. But if conscience submits to God, it will be energized. That's where we find life. Isn't that what he says in 1 John? In Christ we find life. We find it abundantly. That's why we, we live these, these sinful, sinless lives. The more that we are, we are walking in Christ, the sin isn't there. To what is your conscience submitted? I've got a twofold challenge for you for this week. I want you to think first, think of reasons to be thankful for how God made you. Just think of them, list them down if you need to, and then thank him for those things. But number two, don't just do that for yourself. I want you to go and do that for somebody else. Not coming up with reasons for them to be thankful for how God made them, but ways and reasons you are thankful for how God made that person. And go and tell them, just to encourage those people. Listen, God is perfect. He is all wise. He knows all things of all time, including the future. He doesn't mess up. And God created you. No matter what message you may have received from anyone else, God created you to be you. Sin flaws that. And aside from that sin, he created people good, aside from sin. In Christ, because of Christ, you are lovable and you are acceptable. Not only that, you are actually loved and accepted by the one who matters most. And you have a purpose and you have a place and it's good and it's valuable. That is every one of you. If you're thinking for some reason that doesn't apply to you, you're wrong. That applies to you. And we would love the opportunity to introduce you to that Savior, that Creator who loves you so much. If you don't know Him yet, we would love to make that introduction and tell you more about Him. And if you do know Him and you're still struggling with these things, we are here to help point you to help and walk alongside you. So in a moment, I'm going to pray. We're going to sing. And as we're singing, I'm going to be up here with my wife. And we'll have some other men and their wives out of the four-year pastors just ready to talk to you about these things and point you in that direction. We're here for you and all of these things. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have designed us to be exactly who you want us to be. That you, you've got roles for men, for women, for us in, in all kinds of different ways. And we are not to be divided up by these things. But God, we are to see how, how we complement each other and how you use us in such beautiful ways to accomplish your purposes. I know that there are some in here who don't like who they are. And we don't want to like who we are when we're talking about the sin that, that besets us so often. But we want to like who you've made us, how you've gifted us, and, and, and your wonderful creation and design, and, and your love and acceptance for us. Lord, help us to believe that truth and walk in that truth. And God, help us to submit to your design, to your order, for your glory, for the sake of angels, for the sake of others, and for our joy. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.